All right, open up our Bibles, please, to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We'll go ahead and pray and ask the Lord for help this morning with our Sunday school lesson here. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, Lord, and thank you for this chance for us to come together to learn more about you and your word. And Father, I just ask that you fill us with the Holy Ghost, you'll be able to illuminate us and teach us with regards to the third uh, mystery of the kingdom of God here, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Father, I give you thanks and praise for all things, especially for the salvation that you gave your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. And this morning we'll continue our studies here uh, with regards to the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And this morning we're going to look at a mystery that results from the two great mysteries being taken together. Okay. And this is why it's very important to understand this mystery specifically, because it will basically affect whether or not you can actually be faithful to Christ in life. Okay. If you don't get this one right, you're going to have a lot of troubles walking with God on earth. Okay. And so we're in Colossians 1. Let's go to verse 21. We'll start there. And the Apostle is saying to the Colossian church, uh, uh, Today the church of Jesus Christ is in the age of Laodicea, which is located near Colossae in Greece. So this kind of applies to us more than anyone else, spiritually speaking. But in Colossians 1 verse 21, Paul says, And you, talking to us, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, and we were when we were lost in our sins, yet now hath he, that's Jesus, reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. And we saw that that was the mystery of godliness there. God was manifest in the flesh, and part of that was the reality that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, right? To present you, no, sorry, to present you holy and unblameable and unprovable in his sight. And there's Christ in the church. God, Jesus Christ, is trying to make us holy by the washing of the water by the word and through the power of his spirit, right? Yeah. Notice the colon. Now here's here's the key now, verse 23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled. So here's something that requires you to make a choice, Christian. You're born again, you're saved, now you gotta make the choice to continue in the faith, grounded and settled. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. You might say, Well, I receive the gospel. Yeah, but you can be convinced to move away from the hope of the gospel. That blessed hope is Jesus Christ, it's the great God. He is the hope. You can be moving away from him if you don't decide to continue in the faith. You see? Which ye have heard. Okay. Go to verse 26 now. All that is to say that is connected to verse 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is your hope. You can be moved away from him, even though you know him personally and you're born again. You have to make the choice to continue in the faith, grounded and settled. See? Verse 28, now notice this. Whom we preach, Paul, and I believe was it uh, also Timotheus. Paul and Timotheus, we, they both preached about this Jesus, warning every man. So that's part of it. You live for God by preaching that gospel that you heard. But then also, and teaching every man in all wisdom, and that's you growing in grace and knowledge, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And that's the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Because now Christ lives in you because of what he did through the mystery of godliness and him making you part of his body, becoming his members, his bones, his flesh, now he lives in you in some way. And you have to make the choice to grow and allow that hope of glory in you to be manifest to others in your life. That's why the two great mysteries make this one a reality for you right now. This is what's going to affect your walk here today. And so the first question may be, well, how is this even possible? How can God live in me? Okay. Good question. Go to Romans 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans 5 and verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, being justified by faith, 
And we saw with the mystery of godliness that the Lord was risen from the dead. He was raised again for our justification, right? So you trusted in Jesus Christ. You trusted in his work at Calvary to save you from your sins. Then, therefore, being justified by the faith you placed in Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how it begins. You become part of the family of God. You were once his enemy, and now you're one of his children, right? <coughs> that's, this is part of why Christ could be in you and you have a hope of eternal glory see? continuing verse 5 same chapter and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us and you see now that part of that justification resulted in the Holy Ghost himself being shed abroad in your heart and guess what the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God the Spirit of Christ Christ is in you, just like the mystery says. He really is in there. He's in your heart. Okay. And it's for that reason that Romans 8, verse 16 says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit, that's the Spirit of God with a capital S, bears witness to your spirit with a lowercase s, because he lives in your heart, that we are the children of God. That's how you know you're saved. <coughs> See? I can't go back to my water baptism or anything like that to find out if I'm saved. Any other physical work I've ever done, I need to have the witness of the Spirit of God in my heart telling me that. It's the same way you know you exist, period. How do, how do you know that you're alive? Well, I, I think, therefore, I am, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's exactly the same thing with the new birth. When you're born again, you just know. That's why. Okay. Because Christ is in you, and he's testifying that to your spirit through his. So that's the simplicity of it. Let's take it a step up. Because the mysteries are usually multifaceted, right? Go to Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Now we saw this is how Christ is in you, right? Well, what about that hope of glory? Showing you have something to look forward to in the future. Well, why is that so? In part because of Ephesians 1 verse 12, where the Bible says, that we should be to the praise of His glory. See, this is your future, Christian. You should be part of the glory of God to His praise. He's working you towards this. He wants to make you holy and blameable and reprovable in His sight, like we read in Colossians 1. Mm -hmm. So part of why He put His Spirit in you is to do something with that. Yeah. Verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So you heard that, right? In whom also after that ye believed, notice, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And there's the Holy Ghost being shut about in your heart. He also put a seal there. Okay? Signed, sealed, and delivered. This is why, guess what? Eternal security is true. Like we saw with the mystery of Christ in the church. You're part of his body now. Yeah. Can't be pulled out of Christ. That would have to basically result in Calvary being reversed. Impossible. Yeah. Verse 14 which is the earnest of our inheritance. So the Spirit of God testifying to your spirit, there is child. This is the earnest. This is God telling you, look, this is a reality. Let me give you something, my spirit, to make sure you understand and you know what I have working towards for you in the future. I'm going to make you the hope. I'm going to make you the praise of my glory. Okay. The earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And other studies will find out that that's talking about your body. The adoption to it, the redemption of your body. Okay. This is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and God's going to claim it fully in the future. But your, your inside, your inner man is completely good. Okay, You have eternal life. Now, what is the seal? Go to 2 Timothy 2. Going a little deep. Most people stop here and say, look, eternal security is true because we're sealed. Well, what's the seal? Okay. Is it like a seal like a Ziploc bag? Is that what it is? Or is it like the, the seal of a, of a royal king where they take that, that clay and they mold it with a stamp and then it dries up and then it holds a letter in? Is that that kind of seal? What, what is it? Okay. Or is it something completely different? I don't know. Well, in 2 Timothy 2 verse 19, Paul says to Timothy, notice now he's talking to Timothy. Someone's going to be a preacher. He wants him to understand these deeper truths. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, that's Jesus Christ, having this seal, this is the seal of Jesus Christ, right? Here. The seal of the Holy Spirit of promise. It's got two parts. 
The Lord knoweth them that are his. So when you're born again, when you're saved, God knows that you're his. And this is a comfort. Because if you happen to be getting a little older and you're, you feel like you're not remembering everything the way you used to and all this stuff, guess what? The Lord knows that you're his. Don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about you knowing if you're yours. And even for those that are younger, that are lost in sin and dealing with problems and they're very carnal, they don't even remember if they're saved or not. God knows that they are. That's the beauty of that seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. See? He knows you, even if you forget that you know him. But then the second part, and, see that? Separate sentence. Let, so that's to allow, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now this is the part where you have to make the choice to continue in the faith, ground and settled. You have the capacity, you have the ability through the seal to be able to live the supernatural Christian life. Are you going to depart from iniquity or not? Your choice. Now you should. If you want to be made unto the praise of his glory, but that's up to you. Okay, Christ in you is why he knows that, that, that uh, you're his, right? But the hope of glory is what you should be doing when you depart from iniquity, to show other people that God really does live in you. Yeah. Right? It's very simple. Yeah. Now I think that's interesting, a little deeper here, talking about the iniquity there. Notice that as a Christian you can't really commit sin anymore. You're not a sinner, and there's reasons for that. But in your spirit, which is iniquity, iniquity, spiritual sin, you can do that. You can get filthy there. Okay. You have to make the choice in your soul to depart from iniquity in the world. Allow your spirit that's now alive and connected to God to start listening to God is what this means in English. Okay. I need a little help. There. Now, to go a little deeper now, multifaceted, 1 John 3. 1 John 3. Well, how does this work? Okay, this, the Holy Ghost has shed abroad in my heart. What exactly is there? Might be the question you might have. Or probably not, but you might have read this verse in 1 John 3 and been very confused. 1 John 3 and verse 9, the Bible says, which means it's true, by the way. The Bible says it. Okay? Whosoever is born of God, just because you don't get it doesn't mean it isn't true. Okay? Then it's very important to understand. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. You're like, wait, wait a minute. I'm born again. I'm born of God. But I, I, I sin? How does this work? Okay. For his seed remaineth in him. That's why you have to keep reading. Okay. He's going to explain it to you. And he cannot sin, that's the person who has the seed of God in them, whatever that is, because he is born of God. And for some way and in somehow, we don't really get it, it seems like, all right, for most people don't. But in some way, we don't commit sin anymore. If you're born again, you, you don't. Okay. But many, you just said that you could commit iniquity and all this. Isn't that sin? Well, yeah, so aren't you contradicting yourself? No. Yeah. You have to know what he's talking about. Okay. What is that seed? Okay. The seed could be the Word of God with a capital W, or the Word of God with a lowercase w. They're both incorruptible. They're both necessary to be born again. And Jesus Christ does live in you, right? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Because he lives in you, in some way, shape, or form, you can't sin anymore. But in some way, shape, or form, you still do. Okay. Now we know the verse in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, right? It talks about if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And we preach it, and yet are still on our old bodies, and we're wondering what's going on there. Yeah. Well, something changed in you when you got saved. And that changed your spiritual makeup, your composition. And getting into that would take up a whole other two, three studies. Now we're talking about the operation of God that he did without hands, that circumcision he did without hands, all that stuff. But something changed. That's why it's, you're a new creature. You're not the same. You're not just a regular old earthly man from Adam anymore. Okay? You were quickened by the Spirit of Christ. Amen. You changed. And eventually your body will too, and then nobody will be confused anymore. Just have to wait for that one. Okay? But the other stuff happened. Okay? To keep it short and sweet, and just to tell you, your soul got cut from your blood. Okay? So you're not in that life anymore. Your life is different now. It's withheld in a different way. It's up there with Christ in some way. Okay? Your spirit got cut out and was made alive. Okay? 
and sin was taken off of your soul and it was sealed so that sin could never touch it again because if you're born of God, you can't sin. That's the part of you that can't, see? And that's how all that fits. And that's why in Revelation 2, verse 17, it talks about a new name being written for every single person. You were made a new creature. God will give you that name in the future. I may or may not be named Manuel in the future. Who knows? Okay. Maybe God decides that's the name he wants me to stick with. Okay. But now God gave it to me, so it's still new. He just happened to agree with my parents. Yeah, great. Praise the Lord. Yeah. But he can give you a different name. Kind of like from Saul to Paul. Okay. Kind of like from Abram to Abraham. See? Kind of like from Simon to Cephas or Peter. Same idea. You see it all through the scriptures, don't you? Okay. And so now you know that because Christ is in you, you have a hope of glory that maketh not a shame because you're not going to lose your salvation. Because there's a part of you that can't sin anymore, even if you don't understand how that works. But there is a part of you that does. And this gets into why you have to make the choice to continue in the faith grounded and settled. Because now you're caught up in a battle that starts with you after you get born again. Okay. Now what is this battle? Go to Romans 7. Romans chapter 7. Manny, it sounds like these first three mysteries are tied to basic doctrine of Christianity. Yeah. Because God revealed that mystery to Christians. Imagine if he didn't. We would be really confused. And even though he has, you're probably noticing that most Christians today don't know these three. That's why they, you know, we'll see in a minute what they believe. We'll see that in a minute. But in Romans 7, I want to show you what's right before I show you what's wrong. Romans 7, verse 23. Paul says, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. And his mind is warring with the law that's in his members, that law of sin. And it seems like he has a dichotomy to him. Okay? That law of sin that's working in his members is something that we see in Romans 7 verse 5. Let's take a look. What is that called? Okay. Scripture. For when we were in the flesh, comma, so that's the definition, the motion of sins. Wait, I thought flesh was always about the body. Well, not necessarily, as you can see. Notice this. Which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So the flesh is in your flesh. This is where you get deep. This is why it's always nice to just say that you know, your body is sin and all this. But when you get deeper into it, you find out that there's a spiritual component that's latched to this. And that's why God's got to change this thing. Okay? It's not that bodies are wicked. Obviously not. You're going to get a new one. Okay? Aren't you? We don't want to become Gnostics now. Or at the very least become like, uh, uh, what's his name? Have Augustinian doctrine, I'll just say that. Okay? I want to be like that guy. But you see that there's a law of sin, this spiritual motion of sins that you worked in your members, and it brought forth fruit unto death. And that is still there. And you're warring against it in your mind now, Christian. You've got to make a decision to push against that and to instead walk with God. And that's why Paul says in Romans 7, verse 24, okay, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He has a hope that he's looking forward to. Okay? Something in the future. That's why we're saved by hope, the Bible says. Okay? So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, spiritual, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And that last phrase there is not in other Bibles. But in the Word of God, it tells you, if you want to be free of condemnation, you need to make the choice to walk after the Spirit. And there's the battle you have. You have a choice to either walk with God and His Spirit, okay, or walk in accordance with your old man, basically. Verse 2. For, explaining this further, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus... 
have made me free from the law of sin and death. That right there is that second part of the seal. Let every man that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Why? Because you have the law of the spirit of life. You can walk in life. You can live the supernatural Christian life. You see? It's possible. Now, you couldn't do it before, but you're born again. Now you can. Okay? Verse 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. Is that physical death? Oh yeah, that's part of it. Okay? But spiritual death is instantly. Okay? You walk after the flesh, up you're in your back. You're back to that, that old you before you got saved. Okay? And you're dying. Okay? But if you live if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, notice you have to do this through the spirit. You can't do it in your own power. It's impossible. You have to submit to God. He shall live. How many Christians forget that? We're going to find out when we look at these lies here. Most of them do. Okay? Verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Notice, are you led by the Spirit of God? Are you walking after the Spirit? That's what results in you being called the sons of God, like it says there. You're not just children anymore. You've grown up. You've become a son or a daughter of God. See that? You're born again. You're saved. You're a child. You're a little, you know, little babe or whatever. But you can grow up to be an adult, mature son if you're led by the Spirit of God. Paul, talking to the Ephesian church now, he says in Ephesians 4, verse 22, he puts it another way. And I keep trying to fight myself to not say it, but I already did. Okay? Ephesians 4, verse 22. He says, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man. That's how you continue in the faith grounded and settled. You have to put off that old man. Put off your old self. Put off the flesh, those motion of sins that are trying to work in your members to bring forth fruit unto death. Why? Which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Yeah. Notice lowercase us. That's your spirit. You need to renew that. You need to transform that. Romans 12 verse 2. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, is what it says there. So you can follow the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Verse 24. And that ye put on the new man. You need to put on the new man. See, there is a new creature. There is a new man in you that nobody else can see, and they will see one day. But you need to choose to put him on. Okay? Which after God, notice, is created. See, that didn't exist until you got saved. God created that. In righteousness and true holiness. Why? Because it's the seed of God. It's Jesus Christ made in true holiness. That can't sin anymore. Does that make sense? Then? Christian, you're literally got multiple personality disorder, kind of. Okay? Mm. There's two people there. And as most of the preachers back in the day and pastors don't all tell you, which one dominates in your life is the one that you feed. Amen. So are you doing that? Okay. Now, I think this is a comfort when you understand this war that you're in, this little battle you're going to deal with for the rest of your temporal, earthly life, which will be a vapor compared to eternity. Keep that in mind. You see, we get caught up in the present and forget that our future is so much longer than what we're dealing with right now. And that should help you to make the decision to live for God, despite all the ridiculousness going on around us in the world. But it should be a comfort to know that, yes, if you desire to do right and you don't, God understands. He told you why. And he wanted you to know to keep fighting that fight of faith. Keep going. Keep pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Keep looking forward. Yeah? And you'll benefit. You'll be out of condemnation if you decide to walk after the Spirit. See? If you decide to put on the new man and put off the old. If you decide to do these things, and that'll be a comfort to you. Okay? Instead of dealing with the lies we're going to see where people don't understand that, okay, and they think that they lost their salvation. That's what they say. And so then, what is the key to victory in the Christian life? Okay. Well, you've got to think like Paul, I guess. Go to Gal Galatians 2. Galatians 2. Now, I'm telling you to think like Paul, but also notice what Paul said, because this will answer a question. Okay? This isn't just hyperbole or metaphor to be to sound fancy. In Galatians 2, verse 20, he says, I am crucified with Christ. 
Nevertheless, I live. So you say, look, I'm dead. And yet I'm alive. See, it's like the Christian life is full of paradoxes, right? But as preachers preach before, they can all be solved if you just add one little piece of spiritual data. It's pretty easy to reconcile. Okay? Yet not I, now who's living, right? But Christ liveth in me because Christ is in him and he's trying to manifest that hope of glory for, to others. That's his desire. Okay? And he sees and knows that the life which he now lives in the flesh, talking about his body, I live by the faith of the Son of God. See that? That's, the, that's why you're running around right now, Christian. That's the reason. It's by the faith of Jesus. Okay. This is also why if you decide to do wrong for a while, God can just say, well, okay, you're done with your time on earth because you're only running on his life. You're not living in the life that was in your flesh, that was in your blood. You're not there anymore. Okay. That, that life of yours is up there, and now you're running by God's faith. Okay. Which is why you should probably live for God. Okay. People might wonder, wow, this person's older age, you know, it doesn't seem like they took care of themselves. How come they're so blessed and they, God keeps working with them and all this? Maybe because they made the spiritual choice right here to live for God. Yeah. Maybe God is merciful and able to work with them despite that, despite their mistakes in other areas or whatever, okay? Stop judging by appearance. Why don't you try to judge righteously according to the scriptures? Why don't you try that? And once again, Paul says, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the key. Keep reflecting back to Calvary. Keep recognizing the reality that you need to die daily. And that helps you reflect on the gospel truth. That which you heard, you continue to practice and manifest so you can continue in the faith. Grounded. Grounded by what? Mystery of godliness. Grounded by what? Christ in the church. Christ is in you, right? You're grounded by him, and you're settled because you realize he lived for you, and now you want to live for him. Does that make sense? Okay. And once you make the choice to do that, you become what's called a simple saint. Okay. You're not braggart. You're not brash. You don't think you're useless to God either. You recognize that, yes, he gave you eternal security, and you make the simple choice to serve. And you also know that now, okay, the Lord is that spirit. It's the Lord that's living in you. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17. You have the liberty to live for God here on earth in accordance with the commands he gave in his book. Okay? You can do that. It's possible. That's the key to the victorious Christian life. Okay? That's you manifesting the hope of glory after you realize that Christ was in you and you didn't have to worry about other things other than living for him because he died for you. Because he gave you everything. Yeah. It really is that simple. And so now that we understand that, we find out that there are many people who are Christians who I believe are saved that don't. Yeah. And because of that in the Christian church, there are many lies that are pushed because people are not faithful towards this specific mystery. And they get confused about certain things. And usually the result is a disproportionate focus, okay? a false balance that becomes an abomination unto God and unto themselves. Because they put either more emphasis in Christ than them, or they put more emphasis in the hope of glory and not Christ. And focusing on one or the other results in bad doctrine, unbalanced. For example, when Christ in you is the focus, all of a sudden they think they can't sin. Well, didn't you read 1 John 3, verse 9? I was born of God. I can't sin at all. I do whatever I want. I can't sin. Okay. What about all the other verses I said? I didn't hear them. La, 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 la. Okay. And we have a bunch of churches today that are teaching this idea that they can't sin anymore no matter what they do. It doesn't matter. Okay. I'm born of God. I can't sin. Okay. Now we're going to see in a second here, but they clearly did not read 1 John to completion. They didn't even start at the beginning of the, of the epistle, like most people do when they read a letter. They start from the top and go down. Okay. They didn't do that. Let's go to Romans 6 first. Let's go to Romans 6. I know we talked about all this stuff about the flesh and the war that's going on and how we need to walk after the Spirit. We got this nice definition, but in Romans 6, trying to set you up for this to make sure you don't get confused, Paul says, what shall we say then? Verse 1. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? 
Yeah, I mean, we can't sin anymore. Shall we do that? God forbid. How shall we? That our dead to sin live any longer therein. In other words, isn't it obvious? You just repented to our God for what you were. So why don't you show that change in your life? How about, you know, how about you think? Are you, do you even get saved? Sometimes I wonder what some of these individuals even got saved when they do this kind of stuff. It's like they totally forgot why they got saved in order to stay, oh, now I, I can't sin anymore, I can do whatever I want. Usually to justify one specific besetting sin that they love so much in their flesh. Just one specific one might be, you know, fornication, adultery, drinking a little bit of that liquor in the back, whatever it is. Okay? Just one of them. Oh, I'm good, I don't, I don't sin anymore. Okay. Paul's saying, how, how should I live there? And that shouldn't be the way you think. You should hate sin now. You realize that sin was the reason why you hated God and you are condemning yourself to hell. Isn't that why you came to Christ? Oh, Christ is in me now. I can do whatever I want. I got license to do what I want. All things are lawful unto me, aren't they? I pray just like, did you finish the verse? Yeah. Yeah. Well, not everything's expedient, okay? No, I don't need to finish the verse. I just pick, take the parts I like, okay? That's, that's how I interpret the Bible. Yeah, good job. Good job not knowing how to read, okay? Now go to 1 John 1. We read 1 John 3, verse 9. How about we go to the first chapter? Since you know John isn't lying, right? According to John is speaking truth in 1 John 3, verse 9. Okay, is he speaking truth in 1 John 1, verse 8 as well? Let me know. If we say we have no sin, that's what you're saying, right? We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But, but John, you just finished saying that we couldn't sin because we can't have any sin. How could you say this prior? Well, if you read the letter, you would understand from the beginning to the end. But if you start from the middle and try to spread out, that's not how you read things, okay? This is not the Quran. Okay, you can read the Quran that way. You can't read the scriptures that way. It's actually a letter. Okay? And notice, he's telling you, if you think that you're sinless, <laughs> truth ain't in you. Okay? To the law and to the testimony, right? If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in you. What's your situation? This is why I wonder, are they really saved? Try to check and make sure. Whether they're saved or confused, they don't even know half the time. Yeah. And so this should help you understand a verse that I always quote when I'm praying. I pray for me. Go to 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. Paul talking to the Corinthian church about matters of life here on earth and how to deal with the ministry. And he says in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, Christ is in you, you have the hope of glory in the future. Notice, let us, see that? Let every man that nameth the name of Christ depart from the earth. Let us make that decision. Let us cleanse ourselves. How do you do that? With the washing of the water by the word, through the power of the Spirit of the living God. From all filthiness, you'll notice, of the flesh, because your body needs to be cleansed. You need to put that old man off. Yeah. That's the food you get rid of there. And spirit, because your spirit was made alive in the new birth. But you can still make wrong choices to live for the flesh. You serve God in your spirit, Christian. Romans 1, verse 9. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And that's why I always quote that. That's my desire. Is that yours? Do you desire that for yourself in your life? Okay. Because if you don't, you're just going to become a sorry saint, living in accordance with license. You're one of those sons that maketh God ashamed. Man. I don't even want to mention. You're better off not telling people you're saved, living that way. How dare you? Okay. Most ridiculous testimony I've ever seen in my life. You're exactly why many people who are agnostics and atheists stay that way. Your specific testimony is their excuse to ignore the truth of God. Because they don't see it manifest and working through you. Amen. Now I say that because I'm in Indiana, part of the Bible Belt or whatever, and this is what I see. Okay? People in my generation saying, oh no, I, them Christians, man. They talk all this stuff, they don't live it. And they see me, I'm living it. And they're like, oh, well, you're just the exception. Welcome to Laodicea. You shouldn't be. That's right. 
See, Colossians pertains to the church today. If people who were saved practiced this specific mystery, we'd have a whole different situation in this day. And don't even get me started about New York. I'm not even going to. Just ask my parents. Oof. Okay. People don't even have a clue if God exists over there. That's, that's a whole nother level. Okay. So you can become a sorry saint who lives in accordance with license and you do what you want. Have it your own way. Christianity sounds like you got a Burger King up in heaven. Praise the Lord, I guess. Do what you want. Okay. The Lord will fix you in the millennium. Okay. Don't worry about it. Do what you want. Okay. Hopefully God doesn't cut your life short by your decisions. Because you can make all the choices you like, but you can't control the consequences of them. Lost or saved alike. Now granted, you're not going to hell. Praise the Lord. Okay? But you're going to be a bit shamed, shamed up there in heaven too. You're not going to be too happy for a while. If you realize you wasted your 70 some years here in life, you could have gave them to God and been something greater in the millennium and beyond. Or, you focus on the hope of glory part, because it's Christ in you, right? The hope of glory. You focus on that you part. Okay? And then you think, well, I can lose my salvation. <coughs> you forgot about Christ. Okay? You got caught up in having to put off your old man and put on your new so much that you thought that all of a sudden I can perfect myself by making that decision to cleanse myself from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. I can do it all, and if I don't, Christ will fall out of me. I guess. I guess that's what you think. Maybe you don't say it that way. Maybe you have a much more eloquent manner to say it. I know I'm rude of speech. You know, I'm trying to be like Paul, right? I'm being plain. I can sound all fancy and just start speaking another language. That'll really make sure you don't understand me. Okay, my parents would. But the goal is to make sure that I say five words that actually click. I don't want to be like that Corinthian church in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. Make sure you understand what I'm saying. Okay. And Paul was dealing with this in his time. Go to Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3. Very important epistle in the book of Galatians. Because the, the key premise of it is you're kept by God and that's why you stay saved. It has nothing to do with you. But in Galatians 3 verse 1, Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only what I learn of you. Now he's being sarcastic. You come and teach me. This is what I want to learn of you. You think I'm a mean preacher? Paul was sarcasm incarnate, and the Lord, he puts him to shame. Okay? The Lord was pretty straight up. Okay? Yes. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? You answer that question. How did you receive him? Oh, by the works of the law. Well, you're lost. These Galatians would answer the Spirit of, you know, the hearing of faith. That's how they received him. They would answer that right. So then he continues, Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Rhetorical question. Clearly the answer is no. And yet, for some reason, this thought comes up and still exists and permeates even today. People think they're perfected in the flesh. And it's about what they do. And if they don't do right, they'll lose their salvation. Okay? This is why you wonder sometimes, do they realize? Do they even know that they were saved by the hearing of faith? It makes you wonder how much they realize that it's because Christ is in them that they could even live for God in the first place. And so then they come up with, you know, their Riggle Monroe, they got their ordinances and all this. And then they come up to you because you are not an Adventist. Colossians 2. Colossians 2, verse 16. How dare you, sir? You got the mark of the beast. All right. All right, you know what? You think that? Let me just read you one verse here. Let me read you some verses. And tell me if your thought matches this verse. That's all I'm going to do. I'm, I'm not even going to deal with it. Colossians 2. Verse 16, notice, let no man therefore judge you, and that's what you're doing, in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day. And notice, that's not a holiday, it's a holy day like the Sabbath, that's what you're judging me about, okay? Or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, it even told you that, just give some extras there, straight up, okay? Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body 
is of Christ. Why is it a shadow of things to come in the millennium? These things will be put into practice again. But you're part of the body of Christ, and he fulfilled the law for you, so you shouldn't be judging people about that. Why are you telling me I got the mark of the beast? I'm not judging you. You want to worship the Lord on Saturday? Fine by me. I feel like doing it on Sunday. One, it's my day off, praise God. It's become the standard of the days off here in America, it seems. And two, I also worship on Monday, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday and Saturday. How about you do that? And they look at you like some kind of super saint or something. Meanwhile, they're the ones that are the super saints, because they're the ones talking, telling you that you're messed up and you're going to fall out of hell and all this, because you're not following all our traditions. And that's what happens. Okay? You start focusing on the, on the you, and thinking it's all about you, you become legalistic and a super saint. Now granted, I'll admit this. Anybody who isn't as conservative about the scriptures as I am thinks that I'm a legalist. That's true. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just living in the liberty of the Lord, to be honest with you. In accordance with God. They're legalists because they're doing what it says in Colossians 2 verse 20. Let's take a look there. This is what they're doing. Colossians 2 verse 20. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why? As though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances. Notice, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are which all are to perish with the using. No, you can't touch this this person. He's so holy if you touch him, you know? You're gonna take virtue out of him, you're gonna miracle and all that kind of weird stuff. Taste not, you can't eat this specific thing. Okay. It's one thing if you decide that you don't want to eat meat. And I know about it. I respect that. Okay? It's another if you're telling me that I can't eat meat. In my, you know, you're in my house. You're telling me you can't. No, you can't eat meat in your house. No, that's a whole different thing. You telling me what to do in my house? What is this? Give me a break. Okay. You could have just came to me nice and said, look, you know, I just want to make sure that you knew, you know, I'm a vegetarian or whatever. Okay, man. I will make sure I have food available for you. Okay. But don't try to tell me I'm in sin because I'm eating this thing. That's a mistake. Okay. Oh, you celebrate Christmas? How dare you celebrate Christmas? It's tied to the Saturnalia and all this. And you know what? A lot of that stuff is true. It doesn't mean that's why that person's celebrating it. I got no business telling them that they're in sin for doing that. But if I recognize it and I make a choice not to do it either, don't get mad at me. Okay. I can't tell you that you're in sin. You're not going to tell me that I'm in sin. Or you're judging wrong. Why? After the commandments and doctrines of men, and there's the problem. True legalism is tied to attaching commandments and doctrines of men that aren't of God. So while you call me a legalist, I just keep bringing up scripture, trying to show you that every command I'm showing you is from God. Who's the real legalist here? Who's the real super saint in quotes? Because the simple say follows the word of God. <laughs> And so what ends up happening is they're trusting in their works and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, like I dealt with a, a brother, I think he's saved, okay, over in Colombia, okay, Montenegro, who he's caught up with the Pentecostalism and all that. And so when I was just trying to show him Romans 5 verse 1, what justification was, came to the Spirit, he had, it didn't click. It didn't click. You know what he did? He brought up the prodigal son. That was his example for why what I was saying wasn't true. You know what I told him? Did you notice that he's still his son the whole time? His sonship never changed in the whole story. You see? If you become a child of God, that's not going to change. Now, your fellowship with God will, but not your relationship. Does that make sense? Okay. Your justification is resolute, but your sanctification depends on you. Christ is in you. Are you willing to manifest the hope of glory? The prodigal son, he decided to waste his wares, but guess what? He came back in repentance, and the Lord welcomed him with open arms. Come back. Let's restore you. Let's get you back into service here. Amen? Amen. And when he said that, he laughed, because he's like, how come I've never noticed that my entire life? And I'm like, because somebody preached it to you and ignored that very important reality. That's why. You're listening to that guy instead of the scriptures. So let me show you. Let me show you what justification is. 
Let me show you that you can be saved in a way that's not tied to justification. Brought up the saving, you know, women being saved in childbearing. Obviously, that doesn't mean that they're born again because they had a child. Even he knew it. And that was the end of the conversation, by the way. He said, well, you know what? The Lord will straighten it out because I, right there I hit, a, I hit something there. I showed him his Jonah moment. The Lord's going to stress that, Lord willing, for a good amount of time. Because he needs to get that straightened out or he'll never be able to walk with God the way he should. And he looks holy. You know, his family, they dress modestly and everything. They got the whole holiness thing going. And when we all know holiness people, they tend to dress a little better than us independent Baptists sometimes. Yeah. They they look the part, man. But he does think he has to maintain his salvation. And he also thinks he has to be water baptized to be saved, which is part of why I was wondering where his situation was. Kind of difficult to deal with him there. Okay. But that's how all this stuff develops. When you're not a steward and you're not faithful to the mysteries of the kingdom of God that God has given us to the church, all these heresies pop out. And so the key is to be a simple saint who's living in the liberty of Christ, understanding that because the Lord lives in you, you want to manifest his glory to others. And that should be your reason for life, just like Paul said in Galatians 2. Because if not, you either be a sorry saint, living in license, thinking you can do what you want, or you'll be one of those super saints judging everybody in the universe and thinking it's all about you. Okay. So I just pray that we're faithful to the mystery that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for showing us this simple but very important mystery. Help us to receive the understanding that, yes, we have two natures, as it's often called, and we need to decide to live in the new nature instead of the old. But even more importantly, the comfort in knowing, Lord, that